Prof, you can start the session. I can start? Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, masterclass. I'm very happy to be with you on a Saturday morning, evening, uh, afternoon. I mean, wherever you are in the world, I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, so my name is Anne-Flore maman a couple of words about me before I start. Um, I am the academic director of one mastering program at the SEC, which is a master in strategy and management of international business. So it's a program which is uh, running on all our campuses, on our ESSEC campuses, both in APAC and also in, um, in, uh, in France. And we also have a program in uh, Rabat, Morocco. And uh, basically, I'm also an alumni from this program, which I did in 2000, 2000, 2005, sorry, 2006. So I'm very happy to be with you today and to share my insights about client centricity. So for the little story, this is um, a snapshot of a class that I teach in the SMIC program. Um, and this is one of the of my areas of expertise, um, which I do as a consultant. I also have my company and which I developed as part of my PhD when I was a PhD student candidate, I would say, um, in ESSEC Business School. So um, today's subject is about, as you can see on the title, client centricity. And the question is, is uh, would um, that be in the end um, the future of strategy conduct? So I would like to, to start with, um, you know, coming back to clients and consumers. So by the way, when we say client centricity, uh, we should say C centricity because beyond the C, you can put a client, a consumer, a customer, and even a patient. So patient would be for the pharmaceutical industry. Consumer would be for the B2C um, goods, uh, market goods. Um, <clears throat> B2, um, I mean, client, sorry, would be for the B2B industry. Um, and um, also the luxury industry. So for those of you who are interested in luxury, never say a consumer, you only say clients. And the last one is customer and customer is for services. So you see beyond the C, actually we have different realities. For, so for the sake of this presentation, I will use the word client, but you can put whatever C or patient uh, instead of my, um, my C, my client word. So <clears throat> clients, you know, who are they is always a key issue for companies because you can have a wonderful idea, a wonderful business idea. You can be super great at um, developing, you know, products or services around that idea. You can have the best product in the world. If you don't have a market to buy, you're dead. 
So taking into account clients and consumers is something which is very, very important, especially because today we, we face some consumption and also business challenges. And then it's more and more difficult to um, grab, capture and keep uh, your consumers. <clears throat> and knowing that you have something which is very important, which is showing up on your screen. So I'm trying to put my head away. Yeah, my little head, yeah, better, sorry. Knowing that it is six to seven times more expensive to acquire a new customer than it is to keep a current one. So what does it mean? It means that for a company, when you have a client, you want to keep him or her, okay? Or it, if it's a B2B. You don't want this person, you don't want to see this person or this company go away. Because going to get a new consumer is something which is very expensive. And when we say expensive, it's not only in terms of money, but it's also in terms of HR, human resources. Okay, so trying to acquire a new customer is six to seven times more expensive than making an existing one buy again from you. So the whole rationale behind having a C-centric uh, strategy is also to work on uh, client retention. Okay, so having a loyalty rate, which is higher. <clears throat> also, one of the biggest challenges that we have in the 21st century with clients is that they are no more quiet. Clients nowadays they speak. They speak on social media. They speak on many many uh, channels. Um, they they express when they are happy. They express which is good, <laughs> and they express also when they are unhappy, which is not so good. And you all know from um, you know so from all the stories that you may have heard in the press that um, you can really destroy your reputation in two minutes with a tweet. It's very 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 fast um, reputation um, damage. And a building's reputation might also be very, very fast. So you want to take advantage of that and to also, um, you know, uh, face the risk which is um, which is uh, inherent to these new consumption trends. Another big trend that I want to uh, stress out is sustainable consumption. So sustainable consumption. Here you have an example of an eatable packaging for fries. <clears throat> don't ask me how it tastes. I don't know. But basically, sustainable consumption is something which is very big today because. Um, um, you know, it's a trend. Alors, you have to be um, yet very uh, cautious about sustainable consumption because there is a discrepancy in between what people claim and what people do. Like most people will say they would have um, a sustainable consumption and they want to consume sustainable products or sustainable brands. But when you check the data, the figures, actually they don't, the transformation to the actual act of purchase is not um, always here. And this is not really depending on generations. Often we hear, you know, uh, uh, generation Z or Generation Y are more um, sustainable cautious than the other ones. It's it's not true actually. When you check the data, the real data, um, you have people in Generation Y who are very sustainable oriented, and you have people in Generation X or even the baby boomers who are also very sustainable oriented. So it's more a mindset, a way of living, and there are also big differences depending on countries. Uh, when you go into developing countries or in the developed countries, it's not the same trend. Yet, it's a, something very important to take into account for companies because sustainable is here. Even if people don't buy sustainable products, uh, we speak about that. And again, the reputation of the brand and the company might be also made upon that. Another consumption challenge is collaborative consumption, re-consumption, you know, the resell, repackaging, uh, secondhand uh, products, um, buying together and, uh, and then reselling one another. Um, so this is a big, 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 big trend. Uh, depending on countries, it's uh, it's more important or less important. But in the end, um, it's it's a very, very important trend. So when you look at all that, it's it's you know it's um, okay. These are challenges. But you would tell me, okay, um, whatever the age of consumption, we've had challenges. So what is new in this in these challenges is we have something which is unrational in consumers, which is this one. It's like even if people love your brand they would still go for an option which is sometimes um, you know, better from their short-term perspective, like cheaper. So whatever you do, even if you have loyal consumers, even if they love you, at the end, you may lose them just because the, the brand next door is cheaper than yours. So all in all, that gives you just a snapshot of some, uh, it's not all the consumption challenges, I could spend 20 hours just on that. But basically, those are components you want to take into account when you are um, in a business, um, you know, currently. So when you are a company, you face consumption challenges like this one. And remember that it is very important to keep people because it's more important, more expensive, sorry, to acquire a new consumer than to lose one. But you also face this. 
And this is competition. This is just to tell you uh, that if you check the business of fast moving consumer goods, and we are only with uh, yogurts and uh, ice creams and cookies, this is the reality of the market. Few actors, okay, we have uh, two, four, six, uh, eight, ten, ten actors, uh, no, uh, nine, sorry, actors, uh, no, ten, no, nine, nine, nine actors, nine actors, but look at the number of brands that they have. Look at the number of brands. What does it mean? It means that you have to differentiate yourself. You have to differentiate yourself as compared to your competitor, but also internally. If you check Nestle, look at Nestle, how many brands they have. So they have different portfolio, but like each bubble is one portfolio in the same product category, which means that you also have internal competition. Okay, so you need to differentiate yourself. You need to find a way to capture your clients, to capture your consumers. And the traditional way of doing business is no more, I would say, uh, appropriate or can be no more appropriate because up to a couple of years, you know, you were pushing products towards consumers and people were buying from you. But that works in a world where, you know, you have, uh, if you want to buy, uh, I don't know, like, for example, yogurts, okay, you go to the supermarket, maybe you have the choice in between three brands, okay, you choose one is uh, with fruit, one with nature, and the other one is light, okay, uh, diet uh, yogurt. Okay, so you choose whatever you want in between the three. Now you go to the supermarket, so I don't know where, where, which country you come from, but if you go to France, if you have ever the chance to come to France, go to a supermarket and go to the yogurt, uh, the yogurt uh, area. And if you go to Italy, you have to go to the laundry products area. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, the choice is so huge that the choice is not going to be made based on, you know, I only have one option per category. No. In a single category, you will have the choice in between maybe 10, 15, 20 options. So you have, um, as a client, I need to be seduced. You see my point? I need to find um, emotional uh, things beyond my purchase and no more only the simple choice because it's rational. This is the only one that I have. So those two components um, have made businesses evolve and have changed, some of them changed their model. And especially the appearance of uh, what we call the, the, the GAFA, as you know, and also all the startup uh, companies which have uh, created new businesses, I think, in terms of Uber or um, Airbnb. Um, alors, uh, Uber, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Grab in, uh, in Asia, sorry, I was looking for a Grab in Asia. Um, the, all those companies, um, they have developed new business models. And those new business models, they change the perspective in the way that it's no more everything which is made around our way of doing and our um, expertise as a, a business owner. But it's let's think about consumers first. Let's think about consumers first and let's design something about consumers. And this is the whole thing beyond, beyond um, as I will explain later on, client centricity. In my title, you also have the word strategy. So I question whether uh, client centricity is, um, you know, a new trend in strategy or is it the future of strategy conduct? But you may question what is strategy? And to define strategy, you know, again, you can make uh, 50 hours of class on strategy. I just want to share with you three co quotes, which I think are very, very relevant to define strategy conduct. The first one is from Napoleon Bonaparte. So I'm sure you all know Napoleon. Uh, so he was a French um, military uh, leader and then emperor uh, in the 19th century. And Napoleon shared that the battlefield is a scene of constant chaos. The winner will be the one who controls that chaos, both his own and the enemies. So basically all the external environments is chaos. What I've said about competition, internal and external competition, and also what I've said about consumption trends is chaos. Okay, so you will win the battle if you control that chaos, your chaos, but also your enemy's chaos. So basically the consumption trends of your clients, of the clients, sorry, of your competitors, and also your own clients and your own prospects. How do you do that? Being C-centric is one option. Okay, doing market research is also one, but it's part of C-centricity. Second quote that I would like to share, Sun Tzu, so a different uh, military person. You know, strategy is coming from military, yeah? so I share military quotes. Sun Tzu, he said, every battle is won before it is fought. 
It's like a negotiation, by the way. You always win your negotiation before the negotiation actually happens. You prepare yourself. You need to be in anticipation, in pro-action, pro-action, okay? So how to be proactive? You need data, you need insights, you need information, and you are going to anticipate what may happen in 10 years from now. It's too late. If you think today about a sustainable packaging for cosmetics or refillable packaging for cosmetics, it's too late. You should have thought about that five years ago so that you have time to develop it and know it's released. But know that you have some releasing some sustainable packaging. It's too late if you enter in there. Okay. So how do you go into this winning the battle before it happens? You have to listen to the market. You have to listen to what we call the subtle signs. Okay. The things, the signs which are not obvious, which are not said by consumers, but you observe. Like every single morning of your life, when you listen to the news, ten minutes. Okay. To the news global, local news, I don't care. You should try to find one piece of information which might be useful for your business in the coming years. How is this piece of information, you know, possibly something interesting or challenging for me? And this is being proactive. And when you listen to those subtle uh, signals, you will be able to invent products even before clients think about the existence of such a product. And that is Steve Jobs. That is Steve Jobs. Okay, that is Apple. And the last quote which I love is Nelson Mandela. So Nelson Mandela is not a military guy. Okay, uh, you all know him. Um, and he said something very, very um, a human, I think, which is if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. You don't make people buy with their head. You make people buy with their heart, okay? As I said before. So if you want to speak to people's heart, you need to speak your client's language. And to speak your client's language, you need to understand them. You need to think as if you were the client. And this is the whole point beyond uh, being C-centric. So now I keep saying, you know, this is the rationale behind C-centric. So I need to define for you what is C-centricity. So C-centricity starts with questioning first, who, who is the C? So I said the C might be the client, consumer, customer, or patient, but the C might be the person buying, the purchaser in B2B. It might be the user of the product, okay? So for example, the mom is buying the diapers, but the user of the diapers is a baby. It's also a little bit the mom because she's uh, putting it on the baby, but still it's a baby. The information collector, the person who is checking for information, maybe it's the dad who uh, compared all diapers, you know, on catalogs or on YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever. The influencers, um, so all people who might influence the purchase, so including, of course, the key opinion leaders. And lastly, it might be the decision maker, very important in B2B. In B2B, the people who decide are not the people who use, <laughs> usually. Okay, and it's not either the purchaser. It might be the manager, or it might be the CEO, depending on the, the, the size of the company. Okay, so first I need to define who is my C. Who do I want to be C-centric about? Do I want to be centered on the purchaser, on the user, on the information collector, on the influencer, or on the decision maker? And I need to choose. Huh? I cannot say I want uh, all of them. Uh, if, you, if you choose everyone, you choose no one, okay? The definition of a positioning is to position yourself. So it's to exclude some people from your sample, okay? So this is a targeting, if you want. When you target, you, you, you want to go for one person, one group of people, not uh, 10 of them, okay? So you need to choose. And once you have chosen, you are going to eventually develop a C-centric strategy, which is starting with a real, sincere, and deep understanding of your target client's true needs even the needs they don't know about yet. Sorry, I was a, there was a question in the discussion area. Then you have to identify which needs can be profitably met because you want to make profit, okay? We are not doing philanthropy here. Our objective is to make business, to, to get money at the end of the day. So we need to understand which needs can be profitably met. And this is going to depend on your company also abilities, capacities. Then it's about mobilizing your business to supply solutions uh, to these identified needs, and then dynamically adjusting your solutions as your clients and the market detects. So what does it mean? In short, because it's a very long sentence to say something very simple. Yes, I think instead of my consumer, I do as if I were the consumer, okay, the client, 
And I'm going to design a product which is answering a need, which is unmet, which is profitably, which I can profitably met. And I'm going to arrange all my company, all my company around that. Meaning that it's no more doing R&D for the sake of doing R&D, but R&D is going to listen to what the marketing team is saying. We understand that there is this trend. Please find a solution for that. We don't speak anymore of product portfolio. We speak of client portfolio. We don't speak anymore of product managers, but we speak of cohort or group or segment managers. Because okay, so the whole company is going to be reorganized around clients, around consumers, around customers. And this is the definition of C-centricity, putting back the client at the center of your strategic reflection. Even for those of you who may have had already a strategy course, maybe you know the BCG matrix. In C-centricity, the BCG matrix is different because we do it around consumers, no more around the market growth and the, the, the market share. It's going to be uh, uh, the share of the product in the segment and the growth of the segment. So it's, it's the same, huh, we transpose, but basically uh, everything is thought around clients, around consumers. So you understand when you are a startup, it's quite easy to do. I mean, quite easy. Uh, it's not easy, but it's, um, it's not complex to do because you start your business. So you may arrange everything around that. But if you are a very big company like Pernod Ricard, who is going into C-centricity, maybe you know the wine and spirits company Pernod Ricard. If not, I encourage you to check online. You will see it's a very big company. Pernod Ricard, they are in the C-centric approach right now. They want to reorganize all the services and all the business units around, uh, around clients. That is a big challenge. And that is a big, 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 big change with a lot of change management because also some people are going to lose their job. Some people need to learn a new job. Um, and, and you need to, you know, to, um, to make change management, basically. Okay. And also some examples of C-centricity. I'm just going to share with you two examples. One, which is a very silly example. I'm sure you all know that. Prepared salad. Prepacked salad. You know the, the bag uh, where you have pre-washed salad inside? You open, you put in a, in a bowl, and uh, that's it. It's done. <laughs> okay? Okay. That's, that was an innovation at some point. What happened is, one, actually, it's a French company who came up with that. Um, a French company uh, called Floret, uh, with headquarters in the south of France, and um, and they they observed, you know, um, uh, people at home and especially the the women because it was quite uh, some years ago when traditionally women were cooking, um, and they observed that with women uh, working more and more, um, it was um, more and more difficult for them to make salad because I don't know, maybe in the respective country you still do it, but you know, to wash the salad and then to use the stuff which is drying the salad is quite long and cumbersome and maybe perceived as a burden for people who uh, have long uh, working hours. So they said, we have to find a solution for that. And uh, they designed this pre-packaged uh, salad, pre-washed salad, okay, for just observing. Uh, the market. So starting with reasoning as if they were a lady preparing the dinner. But then they kept observing women and they found out that women, what were they doing? They were putting the salad in the bowl and then they were adding some cherry tomatoes, shredded carrots, um, <clears throat> mushrooms, uh, mice, um, no, sorry, corn, <laughs> sorry guys, uh, corn. I mean, they were adding ingredients. And in the end of the day, they said, hmm, Maybe there is something else we can develop. Maybe we can develop the pre-washed salad, like this one, but with shredded carrots inside, or like two cherry tomatoes, you know, inside the, the package, and you pay twice the price, okay? So it was a way to capture value, just finding a solution for the client. So here you see me coming. Huh? What I do is I listen to my market, I anticipate what the market might be willing, I give them what they might be willing, and what people are ready to pay for. I add value to the product and people and the price is going to be disconnected from the cost. So I can make people pay whatever is felt as being useful to them. And that is the whole point. With a C-centric strategy, you can make people pay without thinking of the cost. It's about the value which is perceived in the product. That was an example. And the second example is, a, is a, sorry for the quality of the picture, but I took myself this picture. Uh, coming from Singapore in, uh, in an area which is next to our ESSEC campus, uh, there is a chiropractic uh, uh, place and I, um, I, and I, I, I was reading the, the thing on the, on the window because I, I was interested, by the way. 
Um, and I found that, you know, on the bottom, on the very left, um, if, you, if you look down, down, left down, sorry, it's written patient centricity. So I made a zoom on. which is always um, uh, you know in the in the picture okay so why do you go for c centricity why would you go for c centricity well you may be willing to put the customer at the center of your strategy for several matters first of all you understand the only way to create what we call a blue ocean so to create a new market, to differentiate yourself from the competition, not to remain with all the gold fishes on the left, so to go in a new bocal, in a new, uh, yes, bocal, is, um, is uh, to, to, I mean, might be uh, to go for C-centricity. Okay, so this is first reason I want to develop my new market. I want to develop my new business uh, model. And I want to be alone on that segment. And the only way to do that is to be C-centric, honestly, nowadays for all the reasons I've explained before. But then why do you want to go for a blue ocean strategy? Well, first, because you want to capture value. You want to capture value. Not spending more, making people pay, pay more. Just adding a single ingredient, just adding a service, just adding a, something which is providing value to your clients is going also to make you, you know, at the end of the day, uh, have a higher um, turnover. So this is exactly why you, you, you work on C-centricity, to, to, um, to develop, to strengthen your value, the value of your company, the value of your business. And also because if you are C-centric, you have higher chances to have um, happy consumers. And if you have happy consumers, if you reach the state of delight in the consumers, then you have loyal consumers. And I remind you, it's six to seven times more expensive to acquire a new consumer than to keep a new one. So if you have loyal consumers, you spare money. So you increase the value of your business and you spare some money. So at the end of the day, you win on both aspects. And you, of course, have, um, uh, I mean, you develop your company and you, you have this blue ocean plus the blue ocean, which is profitable. And as I was saying, I'm not speaking about philanthropy. I'm really speaking about, you know, business conduct here. So what are the three components of stress authenticity? Three components of C-centricity would be working on the customer experience, working on the customer value, so the perceived value out of the product, and working on the customer journey. So I decided to present you uh, one specific aspect, which is about building value. So how do you build value? Well, this is coming from, um, if you check out, sorry, to uh, the history of, uh, of consumption, and especially how we went into this value uh, perception, you have first the stage of consuming commodities. When you consume commodities, you consume things which are vital um, and you don't perceive any added value in the commodities. It's like, you know, uh, fuel in your, uh, in your uh, car, you just put fuel to go from point A to point B, but there is no value perceived out uh, of, this, uh, of, of this. This is why we call it commodity. A commodity is something which is useful, but it's not valuable. It's just needed, I would say. Commodities are extracted. Okay, so we speak about petrol, we speak about um, water, we speak about um, coal, uh, well, but it's about extractions. From commodities, we go into the world of goods. Goods are a little bit um, higher because in the, in the hierarchy because they are made, they are designed by people. So it's, um, it's not a bulk thing, but it is the aggregate, um, the aggregate uh, arrangement of ingredients of commodities to make a final product which might be consumed by clients. So they don't have a lot of effort. Uh, they don't have to do sorry, a lot of effort to use it. Okay, so goods are going to be made. From goods, then companies develop services. Okay, so you have a product which is prepared, which is pre-packaged product, okay? And then you add a service to this product. A service is something which is delivered to the final consumer. Okay, and uh, is, um, is something which is adding, yeah, already it's starting adding some value to the, to the client. But it's just uh, something people pay for. Okay, you pay for a service. You pay for after-sale services. It's part of the price of the product. 
And the last stage is about providing people with an experience. And when you stage your products, you provide them with an experience. And here you are at the pure value emotional aspect of consumption. And this is where, when you reach the, sta the stage of stage <laughs> of experiences, you disconnect again the price of your product and the perception of your product from the uh, perception of a commodity, which is enhanced, if you want. Up to services, it's enhanced commodities. When you stage a product, it's no more a commodity at all. It's really an experience. It's something which is, by the way, very difficult to replicate. This is why you create your blue ocean. It's very difficult to replicate. So this is what we call building value, okay? So building value is to go from the commodities to the experience. And focusing on experiences is a way to escape uh, the right ocean and to escape the world of uh, commodities and of uh, cost uh, focus. One dimension is how much, so I don't know, sorry, let's okay, start with this one, is how much, hmm. sorry, it stays, my connection is unstable, I hope it's okay now. So um, as I was saying, when you want to, de to design an experience, you need to work on two dimensions. The first dimension is absorption versus immersion. So how much the consumer is involved in the process of the experience, okay? Immersion is the consumer is an actor of the experience and absorption, the consumer is just an observer of the experience, okay? So this is the first uh, dimension, observer versus experiencer in the sense of maker, doing. The second dimension is also how the consumer is going to be uh, participating, whether it's active participation or passive participation. Okay, so it's really related to the first one, but you will see that the examples are uh, quite, um, quite uh, self-explanatory. So I will start with the first one, which is called entertainment. So the four experiences I'm going to present, we are in the world of experience, but we have four different types of experiences. The first one is entertaining consumers. So entertainment is um, at the crossroad of absorption and passive participation. And this is what you have in the flagship store um, uh, of, uh, of Louis Vuitton. So here you have a picture of the flagship store of Louis Vuitton uh, Place Vendôme, so that they opened in October 2017. Um, and they said, so I, I read, it is very meaningful to that maison uh, to come back to the location where its first store situated in 1854. So basically it's to remember the origin of Louis Vuitton. Um, they, um, they, they, they open back this, uh, this store, and in this store, they offer various personalized products, and this is exclusive to the store. Okay, so the store was designed by a very famous uh, luxury architect, which is called Peter Marino. Peter Marino has designed almost all Chanel boutiques, and he's very, very famous in the area. Uh, it has a high selling with plentiful sunlight with beautiful touch. I read the description that they give us. So inside you have a decoration with objects inspired by travel and furniture, such as a flying chair or leather carrier. And uh, the consumer can find all the Louis Vuitton products. So um, in this boutique, they, in, they launched the collaboration with uh, Jeff Koons, uh, products uh, designed by Jeff Koons. And um, in this store, you know, the consumers, they are a passive audience because they are not acting at all. They are not doing anything. Uh, but they are uh, just looking um, and they are, uh, um, I would say, uh, witnessing, sorry, um, the signs and uh, the signals of the history of Louis Vuitton and what is the brand about and what the products are about. It, at the end, it's a very classical way of delivering an experience, this one. The second one, which is absorption but active participation, is um, the uh, example of uh, an exhibition uh, made by Dior, which is called Couturier du Rêve. So it could be a um, shoe maker of dreams. So it was celebrating the story of uh, the, the 17th, uh, 17th 
uh, years uh, of uh, the story of, uh, of the Maison. Um, and it was uh, exhibited at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. And here you have this big exhibit about uh, Dior, where he was coming from and so forth. So there was a lot of um, uh, explanations about the history of the company. The, you could learn about the historical of evolution of the style of the Dior Maison, um, also with a lot of testimonies from the designers, uh, etc. So in this, um, in this uh, experience, the, the visitors, they participated very actively because the learning process um, was uh, done in a kind of interactive way. So people were just reading the thing, but they were learning things. So it was not just about observing, it's about learning. You know, you get something. So this is why you have active participation. If you wanted to understand the, the exhibit, you had to participate in the exhibit. Then you've got uh, the category of um, aesthetics, which is um, passive participation and immersion. So here you have the example of the Tiffany Blue Box Cafe, which is exactly as a place where um, uh, Audrey, Audrey Hepburn, you know, in the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's, where she is having coffee with a croissant. Uh, so they, they created a coffee uh, with croissant at the exact place. And when you are in this place, which is old blue Tiffany, you know, the world, you can see the pictures, all the molds are, are Tiffany blue. Uh, basically, you feel like, like Audrey Hepburn having breakfast at Tiffany's. So it's just, uh, you are uh, emerged uh, and it's a passive participation because you don't participate to the brand. You don't uh, do something, you just eat. Um, but basically, um, you uh, uh, you are emerged in the Tiffany's and, and in the Tiffany's authentic environment where the place the movie has taken as the actor Audrey Hepburn However, you are a, a passive participant. Okay, this is uh, the whole idea. And the last one is called escapism, uh, which is at the crossroad of immersion and active participation. So you are really emerged, you are going to do things and you are going to participate actively to the brand also. Uh, the example that you have is uh, the Van Cleef and Apples uh, School. I don't know if you know about this school, L'Ecole Van Cleef and Apples, located Place Vendôme. So um, you can go there, you can go for following a course, you can listen to pro professionals, but you can also learn about how to make a jewelry. So they really teach you about gems and they really teach you about how to make a piece of jewelry. So you learn something, but you are actively, it's not about passive learning, it's about active learning, learning by doing, okay? And just for the little story, you can pay to go there and you can take your courses, but you can also, if you are a VVIP consumer of Van Cleef and Apples, they take their VVIPs there, um, to get the knowledge, to get the teaching. Okay, so it's one way to, uh, to, um, to, to develop an experience for the very uh, famous, uh, sorry, very uh, important um, clients. Okay, so this is what we call uh, reinventing consumer experience. So you see many, many opportunities. I took the examples of the luxury industry because this is where experience is pushed. I mean, the boundaries of experience are pushed. Uh, but uh, of course, you can do that also for food or for other sectors of activities. Alors, um, the reason why you go for C-centricity is also because you want to have client empathy to develop your business. So, and actually I should have put the title the vice versa, C-empathy for C-centricity. Like you need to be empathic to uh, be C-centric. So what is client empathy? Uh, is cognitive empathy. So meaning I try to see the world through your eyes. So trying to see the world through the eyes of the clients. Then it's about emotional empathy. I try as a company to feel what you feel as a client. And the last one is empathic concern. So I am motivated to act. These are the three things you should do if you want to be C-centric. Okay? You cannot be C-centric if you are not cognitive empathic, emotionally empathic, and if you don't have empathic concern. Okay, So it's about feeling like your consumers, it's about thinking like your consumers, and it's about being able to act for your consumers. It's not so easy. Eh? <laughs> Alors, this is a question that I asked at the very beginning. Uh, is it a golden nugget? Is being C-centric a golden nugget? Is it, you know, always a win-win situation? Alors, C-centricity, so is it the future of strategy? You've heard me. C-centricity is complex. It requires a complete shift of thinking. Um, so if you are a big company where the cost of change, the change cost is higher than what you can get you know, from changing, 
it might not be so useful. Also, you have to know that if you are in the commodity market, it's useless. You, you've seen, we go from commodity to experience and we see centricity, we work on experiences, we work on value. So I cannot be C-centric or it's completely useless to be C-centric in a business area where there is no perceived value from the consumers. If people, if consumers don't value added services, if you want, it's useless to go C-centric because you are going to add uh, fancy things for people who don't care about that. So at the end of the day, you do, you do great things, but people don't care. So in the end, it's completely useless. Also, it's, it's, it's costly, but it's taking time. And it's very, very costly to change from a traditional strategy to a C-centric strategy. So you need, and this is painful to hear, you need to be ready to lose money during the first years. Okay, you are going to see your turnover decrease, and then it's going to be a boom. But first, I mean, the, the curve is going to be that, and then that, okay? So it's like a V, v shape, if you want. But you are going to lose money. So if you don't have a lot of cash flow, if you're not ready to lose money, if your shareholders are not ready to lose money a couple of, during a couple of years, it won't work, okay? So um, these are, you know, reasons um, for some companies um, not to go uh, C-centric. So what do you do if you don't go C-centric? I've told you at the very beginning, it's completely suicide. It's completely suicide to, to not think about your consumers. Well, if you don't want to be C-centric, you can be C-focused which is, I would say, the first step towards C-centricity. Being C-focused is not putting the client at the center of your reflection, but it's about um, caring about your consumers, caring about what they want to, uh, about, about what they would like, or um, caring about their uh, satisfaction. It's about conducting some market research. It's not about using the market research to predict what might be the market in 10 years and to anticipate, et cetera, everything I've said, but it's still working on client satisfaction. Okay, so don't be afraid if you cannot be C-centric, you can be C-focused and it's But it's about all the medical devices and especially all the digital devices that are developed to enhance the patient experience. Um, and to do that, they are patient-centric. So all in all, is it a golden nugget? For some companies it might be, but you need to be ready to take the risk. You need to have a solid uh, finance foundations if you want to change from normal to centricity. And if you are a newcomer on the market and if you want to create your blue ocean, yes, this is a solution. But don't forget, and that's my last quote from a military uh, strategist, Karl von Clausewitz. The greatest enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. Always remember that you cannot plan everything when you do business. And sometimes you plan to be C-centric and you have to change and you go back to normal. And sometimes you plan to be normal and you have to be C-centric and you need to adapt. But be ready to challenge yourself. Be ready to be humble in your business conduct. And being C-centric is actually all about that. It's about being humble, listening to the consumers. The consumer is the king and he's the one who is going to bring added value to my business. Thank you guys. I'm uh, done with my uh, presentation. Thank you for listening. And um, I think we have time for a Q&A session. Uh, Nico, maybe uh, we have time. I forgot, I want to thank ESSEC for uh, having, uh, asking me today to, to make this, uh, this presentation. Um, you can write your question in the discussion area. As I was saying, it's a very short snapshot of um, what, we, what we do in the, in the SMIP program. One of the courses that I teach in the SMIP program in 25 hours. So you understand that in 45 minutes, I cannot share as much as in 25. But basically, um, it's one example of, uh, of the courses that you have in this program. Um, and I don't want to, to advertise too much the program, but um, the whole uh, objective with the Master in SMIP program is to provide you with an open uh, eye on uh, the world, to be able to tackle complex challenges which are um, brought uh, to companies. 
And uh, we have courses like this one, Syscentricity, but you also have a course, for example, on IoT, um, Internet of Things, okay? Um, we want to be proactive in what companies might be doing in the future, because the, the strategy is about um, foreseeing, it's not about short seeing. So this is just uh, um, one example, as I was saying. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. for the insightful masterclass. I've, I myself learned quite a lot today. Um, attendees, if you have any question, please feel free to put your question in the chat room. We'll give about one minute for you to type your questions if you have any. We are very lucky today to have Prof. M. Flo to be with us on a Saturday. Maybe I was really clear. <laughs> well, guys, you have my email. If you want to send me a private questions, you can uh, you can send my email. I've I've just seen in the discussion area that the uh, the the I mean the, the session is recorded. If I'm correct, so yeah. Prof, I have one question. If they do, they do not have any work experience. Can they apply for SMIP? Uh, yes, of course. Um, of course, SMIP is a, is a program which is open to people without any prior experience. And this is one of the specific, sorry, specificities of this program. So feel free to apply, yes. All right, I think we don't have any more questions like what Prof has mentioned. Her email is uh, over here. You can contact her. If not, you can contact SI Asia um, in Pacific for your questions. There will be um, colleagues that will be able to answer your question as well on the program. Uh, thank you very much, Prof and Flo. Oh, there is one more. All right, we'll just take this question, the last question of yes. the day. <laughs> I just want to ask an opinion regarding the e-commerce market more and more companies are going to see centric creating user growth department. Yes, 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 Angela, yeah, yeah, you're, you're correct, yeah. As I was saying, you know, in um, uh, for startups, uh, it's, it's easier to go see centric because uh, the cost is the cost of uh, developing a new company, whatever you do. So um, there is no change uh, in what they do. So when they go for e-commerce, uh, the, the, the sync in terms of uh, of clients, yes. However, um, it's uh, it it, ta it takes time, you know. In uh, installed companies which develop their uh, e shop, uh, it's not so true. So, but you, but you're right, yes. Online, it's easier to do it. All right. Any more last question? Yes, we will not hold. Oh, there is, there is. There is a question. Any yes, suggestion yes. to approach the client to share their expectations when we are trained to understand their value and key business questions? So, um, alors, it's not a suggestion. Uh, you have some methodologies to do it. Uh, it's part of qualitative research. So you don't do it with quantitative research because when you, when you make a survey, uh, you ask questions. So you pre- um, you pre-design if the, the replies. You see my point, you need to anticipate what people may ask you. So a, a survey is able to measure things, not to uh, discover things, but doing qualitative research. So there are many ways to do it. You, you can do um, ethno, uh, ethno marketing. You can uh, use um, what we call projective techniques. Um, you can also simply have a discussion or narratives approach. Uh, diary uh, research. I mean, there are many, many ways to do it, but this is not something you are going to do on your own. Usually you go through a, um, a market research company or through um, uh, even um, uh, some academics do that for, uh, for companies because uh, it's, it's, it requires some um, scientific knowledge, which is very much inspired from psychology as well. So, um, so yes, but remember, this is about qualitative research. Remember projective techniques interviews, focus groups, um, those would be the, um, the most um, useful methodologies, yes, but it's possible. And also, what remember what I said, just listening to the subtle signals, listening to the news every morning. 
This is the first time in a masterclass people tell you to watch TV, you know. So. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess we won't hold Prof. Like Prof will still be um, currently she's in Paris right now. So well on her morning, and she yes, will yes. be at yeah, Sergi we campus. Have, uh, we have graduation ceremonies happening uh, these days. So uh, yes. So I'll thank you very following. much, Prof. Thank you, thank you. So without uh, without um, keeping her. Uh, more time. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Uh, we hope you enjoy the session with Prof and Flo. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Nico. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Have you. a great day. See ya. Bye-bye.